Hello everyone, I'm Veda Prabhu Basavrajapa, an early stage researcher in the Horizon 2020 Mary Curie Innovative Training Network, YG Wireless. In parallel, I'm also an antenna engineer at TTI Norte, Spain, and a doctoral candidate at the University of Cantabria, Spain. Over the next few minutes, I would like to share with you the paper titled Millimeter Wave, Dual Band, Multi Beam, Waveguide Lens Based Antenna that was presented at the workshop on Smart Antennas or the WSA 2018 in Bochum, Germany. Okay, this is how the presentation is organized. To set the stage, I will first present the 5G scenarios and the antenna requirements arising out of these 5G scenarios. This will be followed by a brief survey of the state of the art, highlighting the key features of those antennas. Next, a comparison of the features of the proposed antenna with the state of art is made. We then dive directly into the antenna design principle and the design steps of the proposed antenna. The antenna characteristics obtained through full wave simulations are presented before concluding the presentation. Let's now move to the introduction. Let's discuss the scenarios and requirements imposed on the antenna design. The first scenario is the case of a 5G millimeter wave small cell. This requires antennas with multiple highly directional beams. The next scenario of interest is the satellite based constellation system, which brings up the need for wide angle scanning antennas. And the next scenario of consideration is the local multi point distribution system, which necessitates wide or dual band operation at millimeter wave frequencies. Now let us look at the state of the art and in this slide we consider approaches towards lens realization. The first one is the lens antenna array that you can see on the extreme left. In this case, the radiating source elements are distributed along the focal surface of the planar EM lens. So you can see in the figure that uh, the radiating source elements marked by black crosses are distributed along the focal surface of the planar EM lens. The other approach is to have a transmission line lens antenna. In this, the profile of the transmission line radiates a planar wave when excited by an embedded line source. Thus, before launching, a planar wave is launched, which makes it to act like a lens antenna. The correction of the phases from the cylindrical of the line source to the planar before radiating is done by the transmission line. Another approach is the substrate integrated waveguide pillbox lens antenna that you can see on the extreme right here. In this, the focusing is attained by launching the surface waves through a substrate integrated waveguide. And these waves are then coupled on to radiating leaky wave slots through a quasi optical system of electromagnetic coupling. Next, let us look at some of the recent lens approaches involving the use of a parallel plate waveguide. On the extreme left, you see the design of a paraplate waveguide based continuous delay lens beamformer. In this design, the feeding horns feed into the paraplate waveguide, which is then further connected to a delay lens before radiating out the waves through a flared horn. The analysis of the design 
is, provi is provided using a ray tracing technique in the reference number 8 and a detailed numerical analysis tool is provided to predict the beamforming performance of this in reference number 9. Let us now look at the features of the proposed antenna design in comparison to the state of the art. The general approach in the state of the art is to use ray optics to calculate the feeding horn position and to arrive at the lens counter. In this paper, a proposition is made to design the feeding horn and the ridge based lens using a phase extraction and compensation method, which is built solely upon selective full wave simulations. This use of an initial simpler full wave simulation to extract wavefront phase information aids in the easier refining of the design model to attain beam focusing. Also, in the proposed design, the final optimization is minimized owing to the individual considerations and a co-design of the beamformer parts. The antenna has also been designed for a dual band operation in the KA band, which gives it scope to act as a transceiver for transmitting and receiving at two different frequencies simultaneously. The designed uniform height of the ridge lens makes the 3D fabrication much simpler as compared to the reference number 7, since there is no tapering of the ridge towards the edges. Now let us look at the antenna design principle. On the figure here, you can see that the antenna is placed on the XZ axis with the radiation pointing towards the Z axis. Along the XZ plane, there are three ports, namely port 1, port 2 and port 3, with the port 1 being the central port and port 2 and port 3 flanking it to the right and to the left. The arrangement of port 2 and port 3 is made in such a way that the horns which are, which are connected to the port 2 and port 3 are pointing in directions of plus 60 and minus 60 degrees. Now this entire horn that you see here of the three ports and three ports is then placed across a parallel plate waveguide and this paraplate waveguide is then flanked by a ridge-based lens which is placed perpendicularly to come out of the plane of XZ lying parallel to Y. What you can see here is the transversal section that is taken or the transversal cut that is taken along the antenna along the XZ plane. So, as you can see in the figure, the E-plane sectoral horn is highlighted, the ridge is highlighted, and the paraplate waveguide base is shown along with the flared aperture. The design E-plane sectoral horn antenna has a gain at 28 GHz and 31 GHz of about 10.5 dBi. An additional gain of about 6 dBi is added by the lens-like operation performed on the EX field vector of the feeding horns along with the flared aperture. A ridge-based lens-like transformation of the cylindrical to the planar wavefront enhances the attained gain. And the beam focusing is performed through a transformation of the wavefronts. This is the working principle of the antenna. As an illustration to the antenna principle explained in the previous slide, in this slide you can see the three antenna ports that are excited and the corresponding phase uh, and amplitude distribution at these ports that is seen to propagate through the antenna. You can see that the transformation of the spatial amplitude distribution and the dependent phase distribution from cylindrical to planar in the port 1, in port 2 and port 3 at the peripheral interface of the ridge. So as soon as the waves hit the ridge, there is a transformation that takes place from cylindrical to planar which gives the rise for a high gain. And this is further aided by the flared aperture.
Now, let us delve deeply into the design process of the antenna. In the figure here, you can see a 3D perspective view of the antenna. And uh, you can clearly see the three ports where the horns are excited and the parallel plate waveguide with a separation between the plates A and the ridge based lens, which is also shown, and a flared horn radiating aperture. Now, this entire design can be considered to be a co design of four interdependent parts. The first part is the design of the paraplate waveguide, the second is the design of the feeding horns, and the third is the design of the ridge based lens, and the fourth is the design of the flare radiating aperture. Now, the order of selection of this design steps helps in easier design. So it is recommended to start with the Tiparo plate waveguide and then proceed towards the design of the other parts. Let us look at the design of the Tiparo plate waveguide as the first step towards the antenna design. The Tiparo plate waveguide structure is chosen to act as the shared guiding interface between the three launching ports and their corresponding wave propagation. The separation between the plates that is denoted by the small letter A is a critical factor in ensuring the propagation of the guided wave along the direction Z for all frequencies about 20 GHz. The guidance condition is given as shown in the formula which shows that the guidance condition depends on the index M which can be 1, 2, 3 and so on and also depends inversely on the separation between the plates. From this, the separation between the parallel plates of the antenna that is A was derived and it was set to 7.5 mm for frequencies about 20 gigahertz. The next step is the design of the feeding horns. The derived separation of 7.5 mm between the parallel plates acts as the driving factor in deciding the aperture dimensions of the horns that feed into the structure. The front aperture dimensions of the E plane sectoral horn were chosen as 15 mm by 7.5 mm and the back wall dimensions were chosen as 5 mm by 7.5 mm. With the flaring between the two front and back faces provided over a length of 14 mm. The selection of these dimensions that are dependent on the parallel plate waveguide dimensions ensures co-design of the horn and the parallel plate waveguide interface. In addition, it also ensures the input matching of the sectoral horn at 28 GHz and 31 GHz. The outer horns are tilted towards the center to target the design angle of 60 degree and a waveguide section suitably chamfered to reduce losses connects these outer end horns to their feeding port plane. Next, let us look into the design of the ridge based lens. More specifically, in this slide, let's look into how to decide the location and length of the ridge based lens. At the outset, let's focus on a single port and this design that is explained for a single port can be extended to the second and the third port as well. Now, consider an E-plane sectoral horn. This is the top view of an E-plane sectoral horn. When this E-plane sectoral horn is excited by a port excitation, it projects a beam as shown in the figure. Now this beam, when normalized, has two levels. One is the 0 dB and we are interested in the beam width at minus 12 dB. So what we do is we measure the beam width at minus 12 dB and see that it is equal to 66 degrees. This is being done at 28 gigahertz. Now, when the beam width is of 66 degrees, the next step is to find out how far should you project the 66 degrees. And the answer to that is to have a projection up to the front of a distance D, which is equal to 50 mm at 28 gigahertz. When you make such a projection, then by following the trigonometric identity of the subtended angle equals the length over the radius, we get a length equal to 57 mm. So, a parallel plate waveguide with a length equal to 57 mm and a 
radius R equal to 50 mm acts as the base plate and as a top plate. And the ridge lens then just goes right at that spot with a length of 57 mm and projecting out from the screen towards the viewer. The height of such a ridge lens is then discussed in the next slide. Having seen how to decide the location and length of the ridge based uh, lens, in this slide, let's look into the details of how to decide the height of the ridge based lens. Now, you have the E-plane sectoral horn, the top view of that, a beam projecting from the horn, the 0 dB level, the minus 12 dB level, you take a beam cut there and you project the beam up to a front of a distance of 50 mm and you get the ridge based lens. This was what we discussed in the last slide. Now, as you can see from this figure, the beam that is projected from the E-plane sectoral horn projects a cylindrical wavefront denoted by the dashed curve in the figure. Now this cylindrical wavefront propagates further up to the point where it meets the ridge base lens. And after this point, this cylindrical wavefront has to get transformed to a planar wavefront if it has to act like a lens as shown in the figure. Now in order to attain this, the ridge base lens which we, as which we showed to be projecting out from the screen towards the viewer perpendicularly, that particular ridge base lens should have a particular height. How do you decide what is the amount of height that is necessary to make this transformation from cylindrical to planar wavefront? The answer to that question is to see the phase distribution at two points. One is the point A and the other is the point B. The amount of phase difference between the points A and B aids us in selecting the height of the ridge. Now you can see the side view of the ridge base lens projected here and the red line defines the amount of length that the wave has to travel through the ridge in order to make the transformation from cylindrical to planar. This is the RHS view of the ridge base lens inside the parallel plate waveguide. Now the length of the red path can be defined as equal to the phase value at the point B minus the phase value at the point A and this distributed over the phase gradient. That is, the phase gradient is the amount of phase change over the entire length of the parallel plate waveguide from the, from the point at which it is fed near the E-plane sectoral horn up to the ridge base lens. The, for this distance, for smaller distances at 28 gigahertz, the phase gradient can be considered to be constant fairly. And therefore, we can say that the red path length is given by the difference between the two phases at A and B divided by the phase gradient. When this is done, the ridge height is simply the red path length divided by two to account for the fact that the wave has to travel and again go back over the same phase. And all of these observations of the phases, that is the phase at A, point A, and the phase at point B is what is being proposed here, in which we say that these phase values, that is the phase at point A and the phase at point B, are derived from full wave solver by making a simpler initial setup. And you can pick the values of the phases at point A and the value of the phases at point B and then design the ridge-based lens accordingly. What is to be said here is that the average height cannot produce the same effects as the tapering of the ridge height, but it simplifies the fabrication process. That brings us to the last step of the antenna design, namely the design of the flared radiating aperture. The gain of the antenna can be improved by 1 to 2 dBi by providing a guiding section that flares out at an optimal flaring angle to further enhance the gain. The change in flaring angle causes a change in the path lens between the waveguide and the aperture axially along the YZ plane. This path difference is the smallest for the case of the flaring angle 
0 degree measured outward along the visor plane and it is maximum for the optimal flaring angle. The flare angle cannot be increased beyond a limit as the phase distribution becomes predominantly quadratic and the T10 fields do not add up constructively to enhance the gain and directivity. It is seen that at the optimal flare angle of 30 degree, there is a flat phase distribution at the aperture and the T10 mode fields add up constructively to increase the gain. Using the antenna design principle and the antenna design steps as outlined in the previous slides, a 3D simulation model was set up in a full wave 3D solver. And the antenna characteristics that are obtained through this simulation are presented here in this slide, focusing mainly on the return loss characteristics. The three port antenna as the S11, S22 and S33 which are respectively the return losses seen at port 1, port 2 and port 3 all being less than minus 10 dB around the 28 GHz and 31 GHz band. The band of operation is designed so that it is between 27.5 GHz and 28.5 GHz and also between 30.5 GHz and 31.5 GHz. In this slide, let's look at the port-to-port -port isolation. The proposed antenna is designed to act as a transceiver at two different independent frequencies. That is, it can transmit at 28 GHz through the central port and receive at 31 GHz at the other two ports. To make this possible, the antenna has been designed with a port-to-port -port isolation of less than minus 25 dB between the transmitter and the receiver, as seen in the figure. Radiation efficiency is a very important characteristic of a millimeter wave system. Now, what does radiation efficiency mean for a receiver? At the receiver, it represents the amount of the received power at the aperture of the antenna that is delivered to the receiver system. In terms of the transmitter antenna, a good radiation efficiency implies a longer range of transmission. The proposed designed antenna is intended to operate both as a transmitter and as a receiver. The table shown in the figure here shows 3D EM solver calculated values that depict a substantial value of the radiation efficiency. It can be seen from the table that for both the frequencies of 28 and 31 gigahertz, the radiation efficiency is averaging around 96% for all the three ports. Next, let us look at the directional gain pattern characteristics of the antenna. The multi-beam gain pattern cuts were taken at phi 0 plane and phi 90 plane. At 28 GHz and 31 GHz, the phi 0 plane cuts are shown on the left and phi 90 plane cuts are shown on the right. The multi beam pattern is shown by simulations by having beams at minus 63 degrees, 0 degrees, and plus 63 degrees. Along the phi 90 plane, there is a fan beam which has low side lobe levels, both at 28 GHz and 31 GHz. The table in this slide lists out the beam gains of the patterns shown in the previous slide. It can be seen that at port 1, at frequency of 28 GHz, a gain of 13.8 dBi is seen and at frequency of 31 GHz at port 1, a gain of 15.8 dBi is seen. And for port 2 and port 3, for 28 GHz and 31 GHz, a gain of around 15 dBi is seen. It has to be noted that the three beams are formed on the same shared aperture and also that the antenna at each of the three ports is horizontally polarized. To conclude, the design and validation by full wave simulations of a multi-beam dual band parallel plane beamformer has been presented. 
The antenna design has been shown to be a co-design process of four interdependent designs integrated to operate in unison. The antenna has an operational band in the 27.5 to 28.5 GHz and the 30.5 to 31.5 GHz band. This dual band operation makes the antenna a potential candidate for use in the local multi-point distribution system or LMDS using millimeter wave for 5G. The current designed beam angles can be used in millimeter wave based 5G LMDS small cell scenarios which require an angular projection of 120 degrees in each sector of the cell. Other potential use of the antenna is in the rotational surveillance radars when used as an array of three 120 degree sectors. The antenna beams are directed at plus 60 degree, 0 degree and minus 60 degree. However, using the proposed design methodology, other beam directions can be obtained. The general design methodology presented here allows to custom design this antenna for suitable high gain multi-beam applications. A prototype of this antenna is under manufacture. The manufacturing tolerances have been considered in the design and the proposed antenna will be validated in a full test campaign. The work was supported by the 5G wireless project that has received funding from the European Union's Horizon 2020 Research and Innovation Program under Grant Agreement number 641985. This slide presents the list of references. That brings us to the end of the presentation. If you have any questions or comments, you can always reach me through email or through social media on Twitter, LinkedIn or ResearchGate. Thank you very much for your attention.